first two years of general chemistry and, and analytical chemistry from him. And then at that point in mid high college years, it was time for me to spread my wings a little bit and leave that central Pennsylvania. And so I moved out and transferred out to Wheaton College in Illinois and finished my bachelor's in chemistry there. As I was finishing, I had no intentions of going to graduate school until in my senior year, my chemistry department advisor suggested going into geochemistry. And I asked, well, what's that? And it's using chemistry to study the earth. So after I finished my bachelor's degree, I went to the Black Hills of South Dakota where Wheaton College has a science station and I took my very first geology class. There I was out in blue jeans and hiking boots and t-shirt, which I enjoyed so much with hiking the Appalachian Trail that I said, hey, this idea of geochemistry really does sound good. So I spent one year at Santa Barbara in a straight chemistry graduate program and then transferred back to Columbia. And within a year, my advisor put me on an oceanographic research vessel in Victoria, British Columbia. We sailed down the Pacific to Tahiti. And then uh, the next leg was from Tahiti into the Panama and through the canal. And then the third leg I was on on that initial voyage uh, for, for me then was from, uh, from uh, Panama back to New York City. So I was hooked, <laughs> uh, never guessing how in the world you know, this idea of geochemistry could give me a chance to travel out and uh, go out go out on, on the ocean with, on ships. And I was collecting samples to do my thesis project, which then I eventually did. During the 1970s and then the 80s, I would be reading material related to young earth creation, uh, young earth creationism. And I could see that there was disinformation and mis misapplication of the methods that I had learned in geochemistry which was really greatly concerning to me. And in about uh, the year 2000, 2002, 2003, somewhere in there, I forget quite when, we ended up with a creation versus evolution workshop uh, events here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where theologians and pastors talked about the theological perspective of creation versus evolution. And then there was a session also on the sciences related to geology, biological evolution from an old earth and a young earth perspective. And in that session, an architect started talking about things about geology of which he clearly did not understand geology. And it just seemed like the Lord was drawing me then at that point to participate more clearly to use this degree that I had gotten 30 years ago and bring it for talks and seminars, say to the church and to seminary students. And that's what eventually happened. And that triggered me then to start Solid Rock Lectures, which is the nonprofit for communicating good, credible geology in the church setting. So with that as a background and what drew me into it, let me go ahead and share my screen and uh, get into my talk. Do you have any questions right now when I get to uh, my point of sharing my screen? No, no. Okay. Oh, let's see. You already, well, I'm already shared, right? You already see evidence for an ancient earth. Is that right? We don't see it full screen, but we- No, not full screen, that's right. Normally I have given that talk <laughs> I, I, had, I had forgotten that I didn't had not stopped sharing from when I first started with David at about 7.30 or about uh, what, 5.30 your time. So I'll just get the full screen now. There, can you see that as full screen? Perfect. Okay, good. And I wanna change that mine off to the side. That's great, okay. So as I mentioned before, no, that is not me out there on that pinnacle, which I wish it might be, but that's not the case. That was a stock photo. And get it going here. I think of the, my activities here as really sharing creation story, because that's the way it's developed. 
uh, that we do have an ancient earth. And in all of these studies, I identify and try to recognize our magnificent creator and what he has done in terms of its fabulous beauty. I appreciate this particular volcano in that it's spewing off a little bit of smoke and Psalm 104 reads, he touches the mountains and they smoke. So God is active in his creation on a regular basis. And scripture invites us to study creation uh, or speak to the earth and it will teach you or let the fish of the sea inform you from Job. So those things are basically the invitation that I feel that has come, uh, come to, uh, to be able to study, study and understand what he has done. I appreciate the, this quote from Johannes Kepler. The chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order and harmony which has been imposed on it by God. And that's the privilege of what I've been able to do over these last years. Were, were those chopsticks? Did Kepler have chopsticks? Uh, <laughs> that was good. Well, I got to see that. What? Come on. <laughs> no, that's a, okay. <laughs> That's one of those, uh, let's see, drafting, not drafting, um, but- uh, Call of the Viders. Um, no, yeah, the divider. Okay, I, I, I'm a joker, okay. But that was good, <laughs> that was catchy. I never saw that before. It I looks like chopsticks. That. He's holding it like chopsticks. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but that was good. That, that's a good, good light piece there. So there are three different types of general quality of evidence that I'm going to uh, address. Things that we've learned from ice cores identify that God has given us a gift of 10,000 years of very nice, uniform, warm climate. And I will show the evidence for those. Number two, I will discuss radiocarbon dating as it applies to um, biblical archaeology to give some examples. So ice cores, radiocarbon. And then finally, I'll get to plate tectonics, which supports some of the evidence that we get from radiometric dating. And of course, I will want to have the opportunity to answer your questions. So we'll get started off with ice cores. This is a map of Greenland. And there have been four significant ice cores drilled that have a long record of data that goes back about 100,000 years. And the examples that I will be showing you in terms of photos are predominantly right here, right at the summit of the two mile thick ice sheet. The Greenland ice cores that have been recovered for the United States are stored at the US Geological Survey Repository in Denver, Colorado. And a couple of years ago, associated with the American Scientific Affiliation annual meeting at Colorado School of Mines, we were able to have a visit to that laboratory, which was a special opportunity. There's the examination room that's kept just a little bit below freezing where the ice cores are laid out on these tables. But there is the entrance to the really cold room that is much colder for the storage of the ice cores. And there I am on the inside with my down jacket to stay warm enough even for a short visit and notice here that the temperature is about minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. So that's to keep them frozen. And you can imagine the nightmare when they lost power and were concerned that that was warming up. So they had a lot of scramble one time that we were told about. And what happens in these ice cores is that when the snow falls in the winter time, it ends up compacting to ice that tends to be fairly light shaded. The summer layers are darker because of the hoarfrost that has happened as the sun has beat down on the snow surface during the summertime. And there's dust that has settled during the summer that becomes mixed in with the ice. So- And what, what's hoarfrost? Hoarfrost is the sun heats up the surface of that snow on a warm summer day. 
And then at nighttime, when the temperatures drop much below, drop below freezing again, then it's coarse crystals mm -hmm. that form that's referred to as hoarfrost. So does it melt in the sun and then refreeze at night? I think that's, that's, that's exactly correct. Yeah, it's, okay. it's, a, it's a freeze thaw cycle that tends to happen. Uh -huh. and, yeah. and are you gonna talk about why some layers are fatter than others or? I will not get into okay. that for our purposes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some of it, of course, would be related to uh, our, well, with the next slide, I will make some comments though about counting the layers because you need, I want you to be aware of that. Um, the, the testing, the, the uh, let's see, the mechanism of, have, of, give, of them giving confidence of observing the ice layers in terms of summer and winter is worked out significantly at the surface, near the sur or right at the surface, where early on researchers have, done it, have dug a fairly deep trench, let's say 10, 15 feet thick, a deep, 10 to 15 feet deep. And they mark the years. And so they learn by examining those layers in that trench, the nature of way the snowfall in the wintertime gets compacted into the ice and the nature of the influence of that summer warming. So they've studied the mechanism there. Now, this one is much deeper in the core. Uh, this is a photo that was shared with me, to me by the US Geological Survey. And you can see that the depth of this one is, this section is identified at 6,936 feet. And this is at about 31,500 years before the present. Now, understandably, there would be some summers or some winters when there would be very little snowfall. So as different teams did this counting, there were indeed some significant uncertainties. So different teams did the counting process. I was able to visit with a professor at Penn State University in his office who worked on the ice sheet during the time period when these ice cores were reco recovered. And I asked him the following question, how far back in time did you feel confident that you could count the layers, the, the uh, the, the, uh, the winter layers of snowfall with the naked eye. Because what happens deeper in the ice, the load of the ice from that point up to the surface gradually gets so heavy that in the lower portions of the core, the annual layering gets thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner until they can't distinguish it with their eyes. In addition to that counting, they also run an electronic probe up through the ice and detect the chemical characteristics that happen because in the summertime, there are chemical species of ions, say chloride ions fall onto the, onto the surface during the summertime. And so there's a slightly different chemistry also between summer and winter. So in the deeper areas, they depend on basically measuring that differences of the resistivity of the ice uh, from those chemical species that take place down there. So there is an uncertainty. So different teams did the counting and they get their best estimates to try to understand it. Okay. So, so, so identify yeah, so, the uncertainties, go ahead. Right, so it's roughly like, you know, five years per foot. So these layers are fairly thick, some of them. They would be thick near the surface, but deep, as they get deeper and deeper, they deeper, get compressed. Thinner and thinner and thinner. They get down to just centimeters thick. Centimeter, okay. And, and probably some eventually down to millimeters thick. Yeah. Hey, hey, now, I have an unrelated question to our topic today, but this is probably safe for another time. Uh, just kind of brief comment for him from you. Yeah. Uh, can we study the ice core on climate change or weather of the earth 
uh, in the past? Yes, and that's what we'll see here in a few moments. Now, naturally, geochemists are going to try to find some other way to verify the depth of some of these for this layering count. So teams have gone through the ice also, and they've melted segments of the ice, and they've been able to pick up the fine volcanic debris from volcanic eruptions that occur from Iceland and or others in Northern Europe. Whoa. That whoa is my uh, battery charger has fallen out and I'm getting it in. So there, so we don't lose, <laughs> so I don't lose my computer all of a sudden. Thankfully that battery light came out. So they've collected, and these are called tephras, that is small pieces of the material that comes from a volcanic eruption and that ash basically gets blown over Greenland and it falls onto the ice. Those tephras have a chemical composition that the geologist can tie that particular tephra back to the volcano where the eruption took place. And then at the volcanic rocks at the eruption, then they can get a radiometric age of those layers. So they're, if you will, calibrating the visual counting system and the electrode counting system by having a whole series of like, one slide I have that I'll probably send to David for you to see later has 14 different tephras between 25,000 years ago and 40,000 years ago. So it gives the opportunity to do a cross check. The point is we don't depend 100% on just the counting process because of there will be seasons that don't produce layers as on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. So we, we make lots and lots of effort to confirm that this ice is so much, so such and such old. Okay, go. All right, now the data. Here's the location. You can see the location of the uh, ice core right in the summit. The data here is showing back about 60,000 years. And this squiggly back line is a measurement of the nature of the oxygen in the ice. And when that line, squiggly line, is to the right, we've had a warm climate. When that squiggly line is to the left, it's been a cold climate. So basically, this whole segment from about 11,000 years ago, right on back to this record at 60,000 years is basically the tail end of the last glacial maximum that has impacted the Northern Hemisphere. And that melted away between about 15,000 years ago and 11,000 years ago. So we have now had basically 10,000 years of very nice, stable, warm climate without glaciers covering the northern hemisphere, much of the northern hemisphere. This red arrow is the location of that one piece of ice that I showed in the photo that was given an age of 31,500 years. Okay, now I'm going to shift from Greenland to Antarctica. And this is a record that goes back much further in time than in Greenland because Antarctica is a desert and snowfall is very slow. Therefore, in this Vostok ice core data, the nature of the data here is the same in that the squiggly blue line, when it is up high on this slide, that's warm climate. And when it is way down low down here, that's cold climate. Mm -hmm. And you notice that this is covering from today back to about 420,000 years. And during that time period, we have had 
four different long glacial periods of maximum coldness. That bracket then is the segment that we observed in the previous slide or two from Greenland. So just during this last, that last glacial maximum to the modern warm climate of 10,000 years. During a glacial maximum, notice this ice sheet, which is about, which was about two miles thick it's basically covering all of Canada. Here's New York area. Somewhere down in here is sort of central Illinois, south of Chicago. Great Lakes are scattered in through here. And that's what it looked like, say, 20,000 years ago in terms of North America. And then over on Europe, the whole Scandinavian peninsula was had the thick ice. And then there's Greenland that had the ice that I that I showed you the data a few moments ago. So looking at that Vostok core again, each of these positions down at the bottom is a glacial maximum. And those that are high are interglacial periods. So there's a short period of warm climate. And notice that short period of warm climate is indeed quite short. In contrast, the last 10,000 years, the past 11,000 years under that circle are in fact warm climate. Notice that at each of those glacial maximum that happened previously to the recent one, the cooling down happened in just a couple thousand years, very, very quickly. If that pattern had continued, the recent warm up at 10,000 years ago probably would have been terminated and we've gone back into a cold climate. But in fact, the climate has stayed warm. Hey, uh, Ken, what yeah. is this Y axis, this numbers is? Uh, thank you for asking, I appreciate it. The zero here is reference to an average temperature today in degrees Celsius. And so the scale then suggests that because those are minus two, minus four, minus six, and minus eight, they're making the interpretation that at these glacial maximum that have happened, the temperature in the Northern Hemisphere or in the Southern Hemisphere, the temperature, the average temperature of the Earth was approximately eight degrees Celsius less than it is today. So that's the, that's the y-axis scale. Doesn't seem to be very much eight degrees Celsius. Well, but eight degrees Celsius is enough to show the evidence that we have these glacial maximum and the nature of that those glaciers in North America uh, have the evidence of the, 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 the soil and the rocks, the piles of rocks that are moved by those glaciers at successive different time periods. So before geologists even had these ice cores from, from Antarctica, they had an awareness that there were multiple glacial periods that took place because of the landscape and the gravel and sand and soils that were uh, found in um, basically the, the Great Lakes area, uh, uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, there's, evident, there's the evidence of the tail end of those. And Long Island, Long Island uh, itself is uh, the debris left behind from a glacial period. And uh, just have a have a questions on the extended warm periods that we have now. Yes. Uh, beyond beyond the usual ex explanations of the man-made greenhouse gas and all that, are there any scientific uh, explanations why we have such an extended warm period? You say, you say why we have an extended warm period? 
Yeah. Yeah. Geologists study that in great detail to try to get clues. And some of the clues are some of the early agriculture that humans started to carry out affected the, uh, the, um, the degree to which the land surface reflects energy back into space, okay? So a, a strongly, uh, there's a, an ice sheet itself will cause great reflection of solar radiation and energy back into space. Whereas a agricultural area tends to absorb energy from the sun to a greater degree. So it's, that, it's a delicate cycle of things that are happening here. The, the theory of the general cycles is heavily tied to three different aspects of the relationship of the rotation of the earth and its rotation related to its position and the way it faces to the sun. So there, there are three different parameters that are happening that I don't have the slides here in this talk, to the, but I'll put some words to them. Some of it has to do with whether the shape of the, the, uh, the revolution of the earth around the sun is more, is more circular versus oval is one factor. Another factor is the earth's axis is tilted at 23 degrees approximately to the line of from the earth to the sun and that rotation of the earth's axis also has a wobble okay and of these variety of parameters one of them has a hundred thousand year cycle one of them has a forty thousand year cycle and one of them has about a 20,000 year cycle. And a Russian mathematician called Milankovitch summarized those together and made some uh, the calculations of how those can fit together. And that's referred to as the Milankovitch theory or the Milankovitch cycles that affect basically the amount of solar energy that is absorbed by the earth at different times of those multiple cycles. That's about the best I should say in words without actually having slides. So is that okay for now or I wanna ask another question? Okay, I'll step on to a second topic. Talk about radiocarbon and biblical archeology. span Carbon-14 is produced in the upper atmosphere because nitrogen is bombarded by cosmic radiation and it gets converted to, to carbon-14 as shown in, that, in, that, uh, in this schematic. Here are some tree rings. And uh, in terms of the growth of tree rings, during a wet season, there will be wide tree rings and during a dry season, there will be narrow tree rings. So there'll be patterns of wide and narrow bands that happen in all trees that are growing during a series of seasons of, of, the, of the growth seasons, okay? When this carbon-14 that's in the atmosphere immediately gets taken up by carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide gets taken up by the tree leaves during photosynthesis. So carbon-14 gets into these tree rings because of that photosynthesis process. And animals that are eating the grasses that are growing and taking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, carbon-14 gets into the bones of the animals. And that's where the decay is that happens that we can get an idea of the ages, which I'll step through here. First, to talk a little bit more about the tree rings. The 
This segment represents a living tree. And this section represents a tree from a log cabin. There's an overlapping section here of wide and narrow bands. And that when there is a wide band that has the same amount of carbon-14 in those bands, this means that this dead tree ring was formed in the same year as this living tree ring. This overall process geologists call and refer to as cross-dating of tree rings in that we can tie the rings, sort of like a, 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 a store barcode, if you will. They can tie this segment of a dead tree to the living tree and basically count the annual layers back in time. And that sequence successively can be done from different tree trunks on backward in time to the left as I'm showing in this example. That cross dating is a very significant part of the process of the study of carbon 14 with tree rings. Now a few comments about half-life. Any radioactive atom that has been formed, in this case carbon-14, is characterized by half-life, which is the time necessary for half of the parent atoms that were first formed to decay away to daughter atoms. So in this schematic, the segment to the left has 64 purple circles representing 64 carbon-14 atoms. After the passage of one half-life, there are 32 left. After a second half-life, there are 16 left. After a third half-life, there are eight left. And after a fourth half-life, there, there are four atoms left. So schematically, and that type of a diagram, gives you an idea of the nature of this half-life with respect to radioactive atoms. And this is true of all radioactive atoms, whether that's long half-life like this in terms of for carbon-14, the half-life is 5,730 years. For some of the other radioactive isotopes, I will talk, the half-life is millions of years. And for David Wu and some of the radioactive atoms they use in medicine for diagnostic work, the half-lives might be uh, a few hours or a few days, depending on what particular diagnostic effort is being done. Here's another way that uh, makes it easy for some people to understand the half-life. Most of carbon, of course, is carbon-12. So in the atmosphere today, for each 100 trillion carbon-12 atoms, there are approximately 100 carbon-14 atoms. After the passage of one half-life of 5,730 years, there will still be the same number of carbon-12 atoms because those are stable, but the carbon-14 atoms will have decayed away to 50 that are left. After a second half-life, the number of carbon-14 atoms will have decayed again to half making it 25 atoms that are left over after 11,460 years. So that's the concept of half-life with two different visual examples. Okay, if samples are found today and have a certain amount of carbon, or if this happened X years in the past, this red line represents the shape of the decay away of carbon-14, reference to 100% today as modern carbon, going back basically to zero at about 50,000 years in the past. So if we find a mastodon somewhere, say in Northern Russia or Siberia, and we collect the bone, 
We measure the amount of carbon-14 in that bone and say that it has 6%. With the 6% in the bone, we can, there's the 6%. We can come over to this red line that represents the decay away, come up to the number of years of passage of time from when it was first formed, and we can determine that that mastodon lived about 23,000 years ago. So that's the concept of how we get a, radio, a radiocarbon age. Now I'm gonna bring two independent methods together here and talk about uh, identifying then the carbon-14 content. Of course, carbon-14 is a chemistry or a geochemistry subject. The growth of tree rings is from biology. So two different components of science here are contributing to the nature of this data. The young earth challenges that are brought to the table with respect to radiocarbon is the claim that tree rings can grow multiple rings per year. And the other claim that is made is that geochemists just automatically assume that the carbon-14 content production up in the atmosphere has remained constant over this last 50,000 years. Well, indeed, we know that some trees could grow multiple rings per year, and some species do that. They're known to do that. So that understanding, that parameter, that has to be tested somehow to verify, is that really common or not so common? In terms of the geochemistry, assume it, chemists assuming that carbon-14 is constant, uh, that's just factually incorrect because we know that it's variable because there's a variable production of solar radiation that comes from the sun and bombards the earth and it goes up and down. So we have to count for that and you will see it here in a few moments in some of the data that I show. So a colleague and I have written a paper that's printed in the uh, Perspectives of Science and Faith by the American Scientific Affiliation. And I will send this paper that we've done to David Wu. And if any of you are interested in it, you can look at more detail. What we did in the paper is we established a boundary between the highest expectation we might expect the production of carbon-14 over, in this case, the last 12,000 years, and the lowest possibility that we reasonable expectation with the understanding that the tree rings are growing one ring per year, that the radioactive decay half-life, 5,730 years, has in fact remained constant, and so that process is continuing on through time. And we have other isotopes that are produced in the upper atmosphere by solar radiation that have a very long half-life. So we can get an estimate of the, of the variation that is reasonably expected. If in fact, tree rings were producing many rings per year, the resulting data from the trees would fall outside that band of expectations. So this is testing for whether the, on average, the tree rings are many per year, or in fact, on average, they are annual. Suppose there was far less carbon-14 in the atmosphere or the decay rates were very fast. How would we check those? Well, those will fall outside, also all fall outside this band. Suppose we haven't done the cross dating correctly and it's a mismatch. If that happens, then those would not fit together with the living tree and the dead tree. So we can use the carbon 14 in the rings to make bring a correction to that. Well, what do we find? Well, for 14,000 years, basically of tree rings, uh, it goes a little bit beyond the, the actual beyond this. The uh, 
the resulting data falls very nicely within that range of expectations. So we can have confidence in this result. You'll notice how that red line is slightly squiggly and that's because of the variations of production in the upper atmosphere. Now application. So there's trees that are 12,000 years old? No, these are trees that grew those rings 12,000 years ago, we have tied, remember in the cross dating, we have tied the dead tree contiguously from today back to 12,000 years. Got it. But, so there are, but there are trees that live quite old, the, uh, the bristlecone pine. Bristlecone pine comes back to about, uh, about 5,000. Mm -hmm. Maybe up in here. No. We distinctly depend upon tying these together. And this work has been done. In fact, this particular slide that we did about 12,000 was done about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and since that time, that has been extended back to about 14,000, which we do have in the radiocarbon paper that I will send you. Got it. Yeah. And so then you're finding- Not mean that trees are living 12,000 years. Right, um, but you're finding uh, dead trees and fossilized trees that are able to match the uh, uh, the tree rings. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Dendrochronology, I think, is called that. Exactly. It's exactly what it's called. That's what this is. Okay. Let's make an application to biblical archaeology. Hezekiah's tunnel was built by Hezekiah, of course, but from the name. And it was a tunnel that was from the Gihon Spring in Jerusalem, about three quarters of a mile, to deliver water into the Pool of Siloam. I understand it's possible to walk through that tunnel, and I intend to do so when I ever, if, if I'm blessed to be able to take a trip to Israel. As archaeologists have examined the plaster that's in that tunnel, they have found a piece of wood. And in that piece of wood, they measured the carbon 14 at about 72%. And that resulted in a radiocarbon age from counting the number of tree rings to about 2,800 years or 800 years BC. And that's consistent with when Hezekiah has lived. Here you can see the variations of production in the atmosphere even more clearly, the squiggly line. And notice that we are getting the calendar age from counting the tree rings, not depending on the variations in the production in the atmosphere. So the physical calendar year is coming from how many tree rings uh, we have counted from today back to that value of 72% radiocarbon. Another well-known biblical example is the great Isaiah scroll that was found in 1947 with the Dead Sea Scrolls. The description of the crucifixion in this scroll was so precise that critics argue for years that this document must have been written, in fact, after Christ lived and after he was crucified because it was so unusual. In fact, a portion of that material that's in the Isaiah scroll from the Dead Sea was measured for radiocarbon at about 76%, and that resulted in an age of about 2,100 years, indicative of, in fact, that Dead Sea Scroll material, the physical material which it was written, was written before the time of Christ at about 100 BC. So supporting evidence then for uh, that being written prior to the crucifixion itself. Beyond tree rings, we're able to use another type of, of, of procedure or another type of in information, and that is from geology. They're called varves. This comes from a lake in Japan that is nicknamed the Miracle Lake. And it's not a miracle lake in the sense of a biblical miracle of God changing uh, 
something like the water into wine, but it's so dramatic in that this lake has conditions that it has very uniform annual layers of sediment have formed in it. The physical location is west of uh, Tokyo on, and on the north side of, uh, of that uh, major island. And here's the river that brings sediment material in during storms. And Lake Makata is kind of like a sediment trap that most of the sand that might be delivered during a storm settles out in Makata and then some water and some fine silt transfers through that small channel over to Lake Siogetsu. And in Lake Siogetsu, we have nicely formed annual layers that go back about 50,000 years and beyond. What's found in those layers is that in the autumn and winter, there's a clay deposit. And then at times during the summer, I'll just contrast the summer. In the summertime, there's light colored amorphous organic matter that's a layer. So with these alternating layers, we end up with a result that looks like this, summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter. Now, I had quite an experience when I was at a meeting of the American Geophysical Union that I was at a booth talking about this uh, to somebody at one booth and they said, well, the person from Japan is right three or four booths down the way. <laughs> I said, what? It was so surprising. So I went down, uh, down to the booth and there it was, research from, from uh, Lake Suogetsu. So I called my friend, Greg Davidson, who's on the right there. He's the, the, uh, the lead speaker for us in Solid Rock Lectures. And when Greg answered, he says, uh, I can't talk now, I'm in a meeting. I said, Takahashi is here from Japan. He said, I'll be right there, I'll be right there. So, so Greg and I had a chance to visit with one of the people that has done the sampling of these vargs in, the, in that Siogetsu Lake in Japan. It was, it was just kind of an unexpected land yap, you know, that happened when we were there. So with collecting the data of individual leaves that are trapped in those vargs, the radiocarbon community has been able to extend that direct record of growth of trees, in this case, the data is coming from leaves, but they're trapped in, in the sedimentary layers of the barbs. So the barbs themselves are counted. And so we have a terrestrial record, basically 14,000 years with tree rings, and then another tens of thousands of years back to about 50,000 years with Lake Suogetsu. So that's, that makes an incredible record to work with for radiocarbon dating that's good, quite good to 40,000 years, but it gets more uncertain because the amount of carbon-14 that's left is, gets down to less than 1% or 2%. So that's stretching the, uh, the capacity then of measuring the amount that's there from original. Now, we worry about, say, multiple barbs per year or multiple tree rings per year. And we have 4,000 years of overlap of those two records. The tree ring record here is in the red and the recording of the sedimentary barbs is in green. And you'll notice from 10,000 count of 10,000 annual layers to 14,000 annual layers, they overlap very nicely. So we use the record of the tree rings to then get the calibration of the radiocarbon data curves extended beyond tree rings to the sedimentary barbs on back to 50,000 years. So that's the gist of the idea. Okay, any questions about that? For now. Okay, let me press on and do some of the highlights of plate tectonics and radiometric dating. You are aware that about a dozen plates are moving on the Earth's surface. And in that process where the arrows are separating, the plates are having new oceanic crust being formed. And where the arrows are pointing toward each other, like here, the Indian plate 
has crashed into Asia. There is convergence and, and mountain building of the Himalaya mountains. And in the Pacific plate example, the Pacific plate is moving to the Northwest with those red arrows. And the earthquake that happened with Japan was such a, a dramatic example of that. What drives this? The driving mechanism is that the outer core of the earth is molten. If we think of the example of a beaker here in the laboratory and we put a Bunsen burner right under the middle of the beaker, the water in the center is going to get hot, it's going to rise and it's going to sink around the outside. So convection cells are set up. Similarly in the Earth's mantle, the heating from the outer core heats up the mantle rock enough that it rises somewhat and then it establishes convection cells the way that are shown in the slide and it carries the continents apart and new oceanic crust is formed at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. We have multiple lines of evidence to support the fact that this has happened over the last, in the Atlantic, about 170 million years. So now we're going to look at the Pacific Ocean Basin and the Hawaiian Islands and the Emperor Seamounts as an example. You remember the earthquake about 10 years ago because the Pacific Ocean plate was moving to the Northwest, putting stress and stress and stress on the structure there of the, of the islands that make up Japan until the stress was so great that it slipped very rapidly in just seconds and over a, over a slippage of about 100 feet just quickly and caused the tsunami and the devastation over that. So there's a picture of one of the worst tsunami segments that, uh, that I was able to find at that time, just devastating, that, uh, that we all had the agony of watching up into that Japan. Now, in the big island of Hawaii, we have the Kilauea volcano down here in the south east corner of the big island that has been actively producing lava for decades and it's one of the most active that increases in fact the surface area of Hawaii and uh, a couple of years ago I think this was 19 eight, or 2018 lava was flowing down through communities and destroying buildings in this case crossing a road and that process has continued it's, it's been going on for, uh, for some millions of years, forming different islands. Here's the model of our understanding. In the mantle, there's a hot spot of lava, and the lava from that hot spot continues through a plume up through the Pacific Ocean plate, the crust, the Pacific crust, and it spills out first on the seafloor and then it builds up enough and it builds islands above the above sea level. And the Pacific Ocean plate keeps moving to the Northwest. So there have been a series of islands to the Northwest over a long period of time. One model I heard describe this, think of using a piece of paper and slowly moving it over a burning candle and you would get a variety of burn spots successively on that piece of paper as the paper moved over the, uh, over the flame. This is what's happening and that islands are built slowly as the plate has moved northward. Now, on all of those islands, geologists have gone out and they have collected the igneous rocks and they have carried out the potassium argon radiometric dating method, which is used to determine how long ago those volcanic igneous rocks formed from a lava to crystals on solid. And so on the big island of Hawaii, of course, we have some that are very young, too young to measure with that method. But on the big island, there are some that have ages of 400,000 years and then successively it gets older and older. And then on Oahu, uh, 2.6 million years where Honolulu is located, 
in the more northwestern uh, honeymoon island, 5.1 million years from the potassium argon method. Now, going successively beyond the big islands of Hawaii and the Hawaiian islands down here on the lower right to 5 million years, there are also submarine mountains successively the whole distance up there to the Aleutian Islands. And the ages of these, you will notice, continually increases. At about 43 million years ago, there was a change of the orientation of the movement of the plate. And ultimately, this process has been going on such that the oldest age in this sequence is 80 million years. So 80 million years ago, that spot up here that's now at the Aleutians was down here over that hot spot where the big island of Hawaii is now located. Well, we have distance and we have time. So we can measure the rate at which that whole plate has been moving on average. And that works out to 3.2 inches per year. And the segment onto the north is 1,500 miles from 43 up to 80 million years. And that average rate is 2.6 inches per year. So here we have plate tectonics. A plate moving is showing us that it's fairly uniform movement with some average movements then can be observed over the last 80 million years. So the plate movement is helping us to confirm the methodology of the potassium argon method. If it were useless and didn't work, the results would be random. And a common theme that's raised by young earth creationists, how can I trust radiometric dating? Well, here's a case where we compare it with a different data recorder that indicates long ages. That is, our other data recorder is the plate moving slowly. Today, we have the technology with satellites that we can actually measure how much a particular spot on the surface of the Earth is physically moving today. And there at Hilo on the Big Island of Hawaii, the average movement today is 3.1 inches per year. So notice here, we have taken a modern measurement by satellites, and we have demonstrated that it works today for something that the radiometric method of potassium argon has, accept, has extended that sequence on back that's been going on for 80 million years. You know, research doesn't get any better than that to get a modern confirmation for this long history. That's really pretty thrilling. Now, I do have a segment of more about clocks in the rocks, but I think for our purposes here, we've gone about an hour. So for now, I'm going to jump through to uh, some concluding comments. I'm going to discard the comments in there and go a little bit farther and get, uh, let's see, let me just get to, uh, let me just mention about the age of the earth and uh, then bring this to the Q&A time. So to get started. Now, um, radioactive at the radioactive atom of uranium-238 has a very long half-life of four and a half billion years, and it decays to lead-206. There was a very ingenious method developed by this gentleman, Claire Patterson, and a, another geochemist by getting some information about the lead isotopes that are in a meteor from meteor crater and making a calculation for the age of the earth that I'll, that I'll describe here in momentarily. 
Now, that year that I spent at University of California, Santa Barbara, there was a new professor, a lead isotope specialist named George Tilton. And I had my very first geochemistry class from this gentleman. And I learned about three years ago that he was the author of that original paper published in the 1950s about the age of the earth. And at one point I actually spoke to his, uh, to his daughter, just finding out, you know, cause I hadn't connected with him for many, many years and he's now deceased. And he was described as being a gentleman that was very active in his Episcopal church. And he was known as a man of integrity. And uh, I certainly learned my first steps in geochemistry with him, which I appreciate. Well, here's their idea. In the earth, the uranium has steadily decreased since the earth was formed and the lead 206 has steadily increased. So their calculation was how long did it take the radioactive decay of uranium to change the lead composition in the earth to that which is of, in meteorites, the relationship of the different isotopes because meteorites are known to be part of our solar system. So they're basically looking at the development, the geochemistry development of our solar system. And when they ran the calculation numbers of how long that would take, the answer was 4.56 billion years. And as I mentioned a moment ago, this was published in the mid 1950s. And this value of the age of the earth has hardly changed in this last, so uh, what's this, but about, you know, last 66 decades. So it's well established one of the outstanding geochemistry achievements, I would say, of the 20th century. So for my colleagues like Greg Davidson and I and others, uh, the vast majority of all Christian geologists recognize that the earth is ancient. And we feel that God has given us some pretty amazing tools to test and verify our understanding of earth history. And it's been a fabulous ride, I have to say. <laughs> So I'll stop there and give you an opportunity to ask some questions as I'm at about uh, right about a full hour. Yes. And let me at least come out of that. Let's see. Um, I will stay and screen share because what, depending on what questions you may ask, I want to, I may want to put the PowerPoint slide back up. So go ahead. Anybody. You went quite rapidly over the uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Okay. So um, they're looking at the seafloor spreading. Yes. And, and, and then uh, aren't they also looking at, um, so they're, they're doing radiometric dating of the rocks on either side. Correct. To show yes. their symmetry. Yes. And then uh, also isn't there um, the uh, changing of the uh, po the uh, magnetic pole. Magnetic field, yes. And so that is also collaborating with uh, our model understanding of, of that process. Yes, that's the magnetic field is probably the data that really shifted the whole geoscience community to say this thing of plate tectonics and new oceanic crust being formed at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. That was the clincher, okay? Mm -hmm because as the magma rises from the mantle and the convection cells carry the oceanic crust and the continents apart, new volcanic rock comes up into that gap between. And when it solidifies and gets hard, it solidifies with the magnetic minerals in the orientation of the Earth's magnetic field at that time. There are times in the past when the Earth's magnetic field has had reverse polarity, where the North Pole was down at the South. So we use the phrases normal and reversed, normal and reversed, normal and reversed. So that there is a mirror image of each of those normal and reversed magnetic polarities on either side of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge so basically, it's a magnetic recorder, if you will, of those events. And this is only since the World War II when they were discovered. Uh, yes, that is true. 
Yeah, so it's pretty and recent. My institution was one of those that was in the, Columbia University was right in the lead of the nature of the data because the head of our institute was doggedly determined when his ships were out at sea just to physically collect a maximum amount of data, even if they might not know exactly how it might be used. So during the 40s and, well, after the war, say, particularly during the 50s, if a Columbia University Lamont ship was at sea, it was recording magnetic data, gravity data, um, sounding depth data, and near surface seismic reflection data from the sediment surface. And every day we stopped, which in marine language we hove to, <laughs> we stopped and we lowered a coring device over the edge of the ship, lowered it to the seabed, and there was a trigger, and the trigger was such that a two-ton weight would drive a pipe into the seabed and collect sediments. So Columbia University has one of the best sediment collections of cores from around the world that were collected. And so then when they began working with all this magnetic data of crossings of the Atlantic oh, repeatedly over and over and over and over again. They had lots of data to work with. And yes, it, the epitome was, was the American Geophysical Union in 1967, and I happened to be there. It was my first year at Columbia when those magnetic reversals were, were sort of affirmed and said, hey folks, this, this seafloor spreading is real and here's the compilation of the evidence. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it was, of course, at that time, I had no clue. <laughs> I was just barely learning this stuff. Well, then of all things, because of this book, the Grand, Can the Grand Canyon book, the Lord had my wife and me in New Orleans 50 years later after that in 19, uh, 2017. So I was able to attend a session that were those people that had been working in the 19... 67, publishing all this material about the magnetic reversals. And one of the key things that questions that was asked, as you can imagine, because this, this is a paradigm shift, there's no question, was folks did the, as you were living through that period in the 60s, did the lights come on sort of real fast or was it in a long, slow, tedious process? they would describe it as being, well, each new piece we found seemed to support the plate's movement and then it kind of gelled together is, is the way it was described. Hey, Ken, um, uh, the last part of your uh, presentation about meteorite and uraniums uh, this, the decade, the decade of it, yeah, uh, to calculate the Earth age uh, around 4.5 billion years. Yes, I, I, uh, can you go over that again? I think I didn't, yeah. I didn't understand quite well. Okay, yeah, and and I'll step, I will step forward a, a slide or two from, from showing Claire Patterson. Okay. I'm going to start here with some of the different variety of radiometric methods that are usable. And I want that little bit out of the way. Okay. Um, hey, don't do that. I want to get my pointer going. There we go. Okay. I mentioned potassium 40 going to argon 40 with respect to the Pacific Ocean plate. And that radioactive isotope has a half life of 1.25 billion years or 1,250 million years. 
Down here's the radiocarbon that I was talking about with the radiocarbon process with its 5,730 years. Notice it can only be used for material in the last 50,000 years. So uh, that's a limitation. And unfortunately, out in the church, it sometimes happened that people get the impression that radiocarbon is used to determine that the age is billions of years old. And that's, that's just not correct because the uh, radiocarbon has been not presented to them correctly. Now I'm going to focus on uranium-238. And it goes to lead-206 with a 4.5 billion year half-life. And so these are the ones they use. Now, just for reference, this is the geologic time scale. And I'll probably also send a copy of this to David so that if you want to share it with, with some of the other folks, you can, uh, just for reference. Now, the geologic time scale of Paleozoic rocks, Mesozoic rocks, and Cenozoic rocks had been discovered in the 1900, in the no, in the 1800s by examining fossils across Europe. And the names come from specific locations in Wales, Scotland, France, their Permian refers to near Perm, Russia. And they found the fossil sequence was always the same like Jurassic fossils were always on top of Triassic fossils wherever they looked across Europe. Cretaceous fossils were always above Jurassic fossils wherever they looked across Europe. So this whole sequence of oldest animal life, middle animal life, and modern animal life was established in the 1800s as a sequence but nothing was known about how many years. All of the numbers that are on this now are derived from the radiometric dating methods that were developed with the discovery of radioactivity in about 1900. And by the 1930s and 40s, those methods were sort of still in their preliminary stages but by the time in the end of World War II, the methods were getting much, much better. And then into the 60s, 70s, and 80s, they've continued to get better and better. So all of these numbers in millions of years all come from finding volcanic rocks associated in those sedimentary sequences to establish an absolute scale. Now, this ingenious method of estimating the age of the Earth includes measuring the isotopic composition of lead in this Canyon Diablo meteorite that hit in Arizona about, I think it's about 50,000 years ago. And the significance is, is that lead has four significant isotopes. Lead 204, oh, they are all stable. Lead 204 is not produced by radioactive decay of anything else. Lead 206 is produced by radioactive decay of uranium 238. Lead 207 is produced by the radioactive decay of uranium 235. So lead 204 has remained constant in the earth since the earth first formed has not changed. There's nothing to change it. But 206 has been getting greater and greater from when the earth formed to today because it's being produced continuously and still continuously from uranium 238. So that's the idea. So, and this meteor has no uranium in it. So it has no uranium. So whenever this meteorite material was formed in our solar system, it has a lead composition 
that is related to the origin, the, the beginnings of the solar system when our solar system formed. So that was the, that was sort of the ingenious step to think of the increase. So there were three authors here. I'm showing uh, pictures of two of them. So in the Earth, the uranium has steadily decreased because of its radioactive decay. Lead has stead lead 206 has steadily increased. So they wrote the long equations that then use the half-life to make a calculation of how long it would take for the radioactive decay of uranium to change the lead composition in those in that Diablo meteorite to that that's in the Earth's crust. And they got the average in the Earth's crust by actually going out and using marine sediments because all of the continents are being eroded away, carrying the amount of lead, carrying whatever representative lead that is in all those eroded igneous and sedimentary rocks to the ocean basins. And they got an average of the lead 207 or lead 206 to 204 as going into the equation and ended up solving that equation for how long it took. And then the age turned out to be, and was, this was published, as I said, in 1955 and 1956. So, there's a little slower step going through it. And feel free to ask another question. A question on that. Uh, is it true then that all the lead that we find on Earth, especially lead 206, had to come from uranium? It couldn't have uh, just uh, been uh, you know, spontaneously created at the Big Bang or something? Well, no. Well, the meteorite does have lead 206, yes. So they're calculating, they're calculating the increase of lead 206 from when the meteorite formed to the amount that's now the ratio of 206 to 204 that's in the earth today. So oh. yes, there was lead 206 at the time of the formation of the solar system. Hey, Ken, is there under method, independent method, other than um, radiometric dating, in this case, uranium to lead, uh, to estimate the age of Earth is 4.5 billion years? Is there any modern method like satellite and stuff like that? Although I'm not an astronomer, I understand there's also a methodology of estimating the age of the sun correct yeah we know the age of the sun but that i don't know i don't know what the this isn't this isn't radioactive decay that's something else it's uh, through studying globular clusters okay uh, and such and doing uh there, there's a couple different ways to do that and yeah, yeah the the sun is 4.5 Billion about years. the same, yeah. And the other, the other, the other way we get evidence is let's see, meteorites. The ages of the meteorites of many, many of the meteorites is uh, four point. Let's see. Yes, I haven't mentioned the ages of meteorites. So many of those are four point five billion years because mm -hmm. they're thought to have been formed somewhere within the solar system, but they're not in an environment that changes their, radio, their, their uh, radioactive isotopes. Because the young earth people, they want the earth to be like six to 8,000 years old. Yeah, there's just, there's just no and, evidence for it. And, and, and it's just so far off. Yeah. You know. Their, their mission and their activity is to raise doubt, to raise doubt. Right. Their, their mantra tends to be, you're making an assumption that radioactive decay has remained the same. You're making an assumption that there's no, you can't possibly know the amount of the daughter product when those rocks were formed. And you cannot possibly know that those were closed systems over the life of the, mm -hmm. near the rocks. And they just said, those assumptions are impossible to prove. And mm -hmm. that's all they say. 
you know, you know, the only convincing, the only thing for me that holds weight is they're like, okay, when God made Adam, he made him a, like an adult, a full grown man. Okay. So when God made the earth, he made the earth a full grown 4.56 billion year old earth. That's, okay. that's the most reasonable. If you think the earth has to be that old, that's the most logical thing to say. Right. And then that reflects on God's character. Right. Well, but as we're studying distant objects in the universe, such as yeah. galaxies, he had to then make the light old yeah. as well. Yeah. The problem with making the light old is we can see the history of the light as it has traveled through the intervening galaxies and the uh, absorption by some of the components. So not only does he have to make the light old, he would have to fake that it went through galaxies before it was created. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in terms of the in terms of the fossil sequence for the young earth creationists, basically has to say, well, he doesn't say it, but the reality is the logical conclusion is. God formed billions and billions of fossils into the sedimentary sequence uh, that show the evidence of the passage of eons of time. Right. Of animals that never lived. God just made, just made, made the fossils in there of animals that never mm -hmm. lived. He could. They try to say all the all that happened but Noah's flood 4,500 years ago. But there's no mechanism differentiate between the Paleozoic fossils that have no dinosaurs, the Mesozoic fossils in the middle are the only ones that have dinosaurs, mm -hmm. and the Cenozoic fossils have no dinosaurs and dominated by mammals. Mm -hmm. In the Grand Canyon, there are no dinosaurs, there are no mammals, there are no tree spore, uh, plant spores, they're just zero. So the, the whole thing just keeps collapsing in mm -hmm. on itself. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll mention just a random thing too. What yeah. I always thought was cool was in the book of Job when God is talking. Yeah. He's basically talking about like, you know, have you been to like the valleys in the ocean? Okay. And I'm like, nobody would know about this stuff back then. You know, these things were just discovered the last hundred years. It's a, it's a fascinating field. I had no, well, I've come so much more to appreciate geology as an investigation of God's creation in these last 15 years that I've been preparing these talks for, uh, for churches and seminaries. And now I'm, I'm focusing in on homeschooling communities because mm -hmm. the homeschooling content material is dominated by answers in Genesis and young earth creation material. Mm -hmm. So, and I have to be particularly gentle and gracious, and more gentleness and more graciousness. So Ken, uh, Go ahead. the questions about the tectonic plate and the movement of the continents. Yes, please. So if you take, create the movie backwards and so what is the biblical view for Pangea when all the continents are, are kind of touching each other? Yeah. It, I will do it this way. I will share my screen and show you. Yep. So we okay. can see your screen. We see age of the earth. Now, can you see this one that says Pangea? No. no you haven't restarted. You haven't changed yet. You need to restart your presentation. You're at the age of the earth at slide number 73. So In that one part. shows up. So it's still in my slide mode. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, let me see if this slide sequence has the Pangea. I hope it does. No, that that one doesn't have it. Or does it? No. Okay. So I stop and I'm going to share, stop, share, and then I'm going to share again. See if it shows up then. 
share screen. Hmm. Share screen. Ah, there. Does that show up? There yeah, we go. Yes. Now, I'm going to have to do this again. And, it, and it, well, this isn't the animation, which I'll show in a few moments, but this does give you, and, and then when I send this to David, I'm going to send this one also. Because Professor Tanya Atwater from University of California, Santa Barbara, prepared all these, and she gives me permission to show them, you know, but I want to acknowledge her and make sure that this will come along with it. Now I'm going to stop share and I'm going to open the video one and uh, show that to you. Now get to the video one, this one. Uh, that's not it. Uh, that is it. Now try to share this and see if this, yeah, there we are. Quick time player. Woo. This isn't going to take too long. Okay. Can you see now 180 million years? Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. I want to make this a little bit bigger for you. Oh, it's, it looks good here. Okay. Well, I want to make it a little bigger so you can follow it a little bit better. It's full screen. Yeah, good. Okay. So that's Pangea, and there's the years going. And I'll play it a couple of times. Wow, look at India flying around. I know, that's the deal. That's, that's what was all about. very fast. And, and Australia, it's like. Yeah. Okay, let me back it up to zero. So this is the way the nature of the, set, the, the plates were together about 180 million years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to play it once again just let it go the whole way through and then i'm going to play it again and stop a few times and make comments so yeah the most dramatic thing is india crashing into asia there's no question about it so it was moving at least twice as fast as anything else was moving in and mm -hmm. found and the interpretation of that faster movement is a complex series of of thing of two different things happening down in the mantle at the same time is what I've read about a, a team, a research team from Germany put that <coughs> idea together, which I read. Uh, stop. Wait a minute. Okay. You can pause it. Yeah. And then I know I can pause it. Let me see if I can, I can probably move it too. I'll probably do it this way. Is okay. India still moving that fast today? Oh, uh, no, 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 because it's crashed into Asia. So it's, it's still moving, but not fast. Okay. <laughs> no. I guess that's why we have the Himalayas. Yeah, the, because the Himalayas largely stopped it. But Mount Everest is still rising about three inches a year because of that. And, and when, uh, when, I, when I show more slides about plate tectonics, I also sl show slides of the earthquakes that are on the earth. And there are many, many earthquakes on the north side of the Himalaya mountains because that's still active. And you remember mm -hmm. we had one in, in uh, Nepal uh, about three, four years ago, bad one. Now notice here how the North Atlantic is opening in the Atlantic first. See that? Mm -hmm. Now, this 140 million years ago is during the Jurassic. Water came into, well, my pointer doesn't show up. Uh, I see there. it, yeah. Yeah, it does a little bit. Let me see if the red pointer should, the red pointer ought to work here too. Let's see if it does, no. Let me try this one. No, it's not working on this. It has to be PowerPoint. Uh, let me just use the black as, the little black pointer is as best I can. It's over here now, basically, where is the Gulf of Mexico? Mm -hmm. When that opened up, then seawater came in and was filling what we know now as the North Atlantic Ocean. And this area that's now the Gulf of Mexico was a depression and seawater came in 
to that depression and evaporated. More seawater came in, evaporated. So in the Gulf of Mexico, if you study a bit about history of, of salt domes in Texas, or maybe you've heard of the fact that there's a strategic petroleum reserve in salt domes in Louisiana. Well, the source of that salt is a 1,000 something like that foot bed of salt that was first deposited during the Jurassic time in the Gulf of Mexico as this Pangaea first started opening up. As it was open for a long period of time, then the water in the Gulf of Mexico was ordinary ocean water at the salinity of whatever it is now, 20%. So no more salt deposits. Mm -hmm. So then sand and silt and mud covered all that salt up. Mm -hmm. Once all that salt got covered up over the time period in the last 140 million years ago, the salt is less dense than the sand and the silt and mud and it's pushed its way up through the sediments in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. Have you ever heard of uh, Tabasco sauce? Mm -hmm. Somebody hot? Hot pepper sauce. Had some for breakfast today. Hey, there you go. Well, the Mechelani family started their pepper farm on land that was lifted up in the bayous of Louisiana, just a few tens of feet higher than the surrounding bayous. And down below the surface, there is salt, and there's salt mining in that salt dome. Mm -hmm. Members of the salt dome. Mm -hmm. And the strategic petroleum reserve is in one of those. Uh, what's, what's, what's also interesting is like, like there's no Panama here. I always assume that North America and South America pulled apart. Yeah. Okay. And that you had the Panama, you know, that the whole chain of Central America. Yeah, it came later. Out. Yeah. Came later. Okay. Let's go a little bit more. Now, now watch South America and Africa separating. Now in this area, seawater came in here and there's lots of salt on the oil fields on the west side of Africa and Angola. And there's huge thick beds of salt in the oil fields associated offshore Brazil. And all that salt happened during this time period when those continents first started opening, because once they open greatly, then it's ordinary salinity seawater that does not deposit salt. Are the Jurassic, this, the, it was closed during Jurassic. And so the fossils uh, on either side of uh, South America and Africa would be similar. That's correct. And that's one of the, that was one of the evidences that helped to convince Legendary, the, yeah. the, the, who gave the first concept idea of continental plate, no, no, excuse me, of continental drift mm -hmm. because of the similarity of fossils. Mm -hmm. And, and Madagascar is on its own plate? Uh, my guess it's connected to Africa, but I do not, I'm mm -hmm. not sure. I, I can't say for sure. Because it kind of just stays static. Through. For a little bit there. It yeah. seems static when everything else is moving. I'm going to guess it's a splinter from African. Right. Okay. That's about the position of 66 million years ago when the asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula over in Mexico. And at the same time, a huge volumes of, of volcanic rocks spewed out in India that uh, probably delivered some mercury and some other poisonous things into the atmosphere that influenced the biosphere also with the big die off at the end of the Cretaceous. And then, now very popular. Uh, I was visiting Multnomah Seminary in uh, Portland, Oregon, and I was able to have a student and her husband join me Saturday morning for breakfast after the class was over. And I said, um, and I said, may I show you this animation about the continents? And she, they, they said, yes. So I showed her this and her jaw dropped open 
And she said, well, Ken Ham told me that the fossils are up on Mount Everest because Noah's flood covered that area and put fossils up there. And she saw this crash like that in Asia. Oh my gracious. India crashing into Asia put those fossils up high in the mountains, not Noah's flood. And I mean, her eyes just lit up like both like, oh, <laughs> you know, it was, it was a eureka moment for her. And it, it's a treasured memory in my mind of the time I spent with her. Mm. Okay, enough about plate tectonics. Other questions? That's, that's very interesting. I didn't know that uh, Pan Pangea started in 180 million years ago. That was much later than Cambrian explosion, which is about 500 oh, yeah. Yeah. million years ago. Yeah. It was I mean, the, the Appalachian Mountains in North America. Those yeah. are the Cambrian Ordovician Silurian sediments. So, yeah. The history Can, of the continents has had a, had the Pangaea yeah. collection of the continents is just the most recent. There have been some earlier times. Mm. But of course, the longer you go back in time, the more challenging it is to put the puzzle together. And I choose, for my purposes with seminary students, I choose just this one because it's simple enough in that everybody can recognize the shape of North and South America and Africa, et cetera. If an animation goes on back beyond that, like where's North America, you know, where, where's Africa? It, it gets too complicated. <laughs> My purpose is I, I start at that point because of ease of identification. So Ken, if we if we look at the Pangaea as a as a concept, then Genesis one nine, it's probably reflect what what you just show, um, and if human doesn't come later until that creation week, which means the bulk of Genesis one, what we can think about is the the, the continent is really all in one place, even down to like you know day five. Is that, is that a, a, a good view of it? Um, let me, let me see if I have, I'm going to back up again to see to put the PowerPoint one up. Okay, so I'm going to stop share. And I'm going to look at my PowerPoint again. PPT. I think I have a couple of other slides that would be helpful for that. I'm sorry, I keep going back to the Pangea, but no, no, it's no, such no. a fascinating that's, thing. That's just fine, that's just fine. No, 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 please. Just fine. Okay, let me do this as a screen share again. I want this one. Uh, share. And let me get that up. Good. Okay, I showed you this before. I talked about the geolo history of the geologic time scale. So. No. These are my comments about that the geologic timescale was developed in Europe in the 1800s. So between 1822 and 1879, the Carboniferous, is, which is the Mississippi and Pennsylvania in the modern scale. So Cretaceous, Jurassic, Triassic, all those names were found in, I mentioned Wales before, there's Austria, Russia, the UK, Wales, France, Germany, were different places. And then here's the whole sequence. Okay. Now, another one I wanna to get to is, all right. Uh, 
another uh, step there. There we go. Okay. Now, from the left to the right, this is the history of the earth. So on the right hand side over here is the modern. All right. The Cambrian explosion is the, here at this yellow line. Notice how much history was before that. And 180 million years ago, let's see, this is 66. 180 is about in here. This is about 540. Okay, that's the beginning of the Cambrian. I'll do it that, because just sort of a reference. Now, prior to that time, look at the nature of oxygen in the atmosphere. Prior to the Cambrian, oxygen was very limited. In the early Earth, there was no free oxygen at all. So the early Earth, was the accumulation of stardust during the formation of the solar system and the variety of plant and all the planets. Well, okay. The first you know million years was just the Earth itself being I hot in the center, liquid on the on the Earth's surface. And it was separating out such that the core was developing in the middle, in the, in the center of the earth, was heating up, and then slowly plate tectonics got started. And here's the, but, here, here's the spot where geologists refer to as microcontinents. So the early continents were at about three and a half billion years ago. Hmm. Can, can I ask a question I've always wondered about? Go, ask. Yeah. You're like the perfect person. Okay, so where did oil come from and where on this timetable did oil appear? Okay. Uh, timetable. All, let, let me back up to the, 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 uh, the one. Uh, let me back up here, okay? Geologic time scale. North, Amer North Dakota, my company, Amarada Hess, had a little bit of production in the Ordovician, a little production in the Silurian, and a little production in the Devonian, and a lot of production in the Mississippian in the North Dakota in the Williston Basin. Mm -hmm. All right. So oil is formed because the biosphere <laughs> has had marine plankton that live in the oceans, marine, they fall to the, a seabed that is mostly going to be clay minerals. And so there's an organic rich shale that's formed by the decaying of basically dead plant plankton that have caused a concentration of organic matter in those black shales. Mm. So, it, so it's plankton and not like trees or plant life okay trees and plant life are the ones that get to coal okay swamp. so different kinds of bio deposits mm -hmm. are formed by different content material so so, trees, so is peat moss like early coal or like recent coal yeah, exactly right peat moss is early coal yeah okay yeah exactly but most oil the source of oil and we affirm that too by the studying the chemistry of the molecules that are physically in the black shales that get heated up. And in the heating process, those organic matters are broken down into oil and gas. Hmm. So the source is, is orga the organic world. Huge, hmm. huge production, huge production from Cretaceous. Just huge. The Middle East oil fields, the big Middle East oil fields are heavily Cretaceous. But what I'm showing you is that oil fields are only basically in the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic, nothing back in the Precambrian. Because mm -hmm. there just wasn't much biological activity yet at that point. And when I say rich black shales, it's still that percentage is maybe like 
like 6% organic matter compared to the minerals, the grains of minerals of aluminum silicates and, and, cal and calcium carbonate and maybe up to about 10%. Rarely, rarely is the amount of organic matter more than, more than 10%. Occasionally, 15% in super rich organic rich black shales. Mm -hmm. And as those uh, deposits then back at, uh, from the early uh, deposits, uh, yeah, you're looking here at the oxygen. So the um, photosynthetic uh, material or pl plant yeah, aren't yeah, happening until the um, Cambrian and afterward. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. That's that's all here. All after this. Uh, all be to the right of that yellow line. Yeah. So, so our pre history before. So, so the Paleozoic is where those deposits in North Dakota. Yes. yes. Okay. Gulf of Mexico is mostly Cenozoic. All okay. Those big oil fields in the Gulf of Mexico, that's Mesozoic and Cenozoic. So that's where you're getting into the larger plant deposits and things like well, that. Coal, okay. Now, huge coal deposits are, okay, in Pennsylvania, okay, the state of Pennsylvania and also the Pennsylvanian time period in the geologic time scale from that slide are common coals, Mississippi and Pennsylvania. And in Europe, it was called the Carboniferous. That, so they were together. Okay. The Mississippi and Pennsylvania terminology came when the European geology was brought over to the US. So oil is really animal-based then? Uh, pl plant and animal, yeah. Mer but marine plankton, mar marine organisms okay. grow in the surface ocean waters and flourish. And then that material dies and the, the residue uh, gets buried into the black shales. When the black shales are buried about um, a, a deep enough, maybe 7,000, 8,000 feet, then it's heated enough to begin to produce oil. If it gets... Uh, if it gets buried to 10,000 feet so that the temperature reaches like 250 degrees Fahrenheit, then it produces gas. So the higher the temperature, the, the deeper the burial causing a higher temperature causes a, the transition from oil production more shallow to gas production deeper. By, by gas, do you mean methane or? I mean methane, gas? yes, absolutely. I mean methane gas. Um, so I remember, gosh, what was or it? Add to it. It's methane, ethane, propane, butane. It's all of them. All, yeah. Not, not just methane. Uh, because that's the whole process of making the, when they distill all the stuff out. To exactly. Separate. Yeah. And then it keeps on going. Then, then to the liquids, you know. Right. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right on up to 20. And then some, the heavy, the really heavy compounds, there's a residue that's left behind in the, in the black shales. I just remember a uh, an advertisement. I don't know if it was Exxon or whatever it was. I think it was back in the '60s or maybe '70s, where where the dinosaurs gave their all for the <laughs> <laughs> for the oil. <laughs> dinosaurs are actually totally insignificant. But yeah, I know. I mean, I just I thought it's it was a good, it. it's a good fun message. And in one of our talks, uh, in my, my talk, geology for non geologists. We actually do have a dinosaur that's dead showing them, and we put a big red X to it. Now, it's not, yeah. dinosaurs aren't included because it's not the right kind yeah. of material. Because that's what the young earth people say is, oh, all the dinosaurs got killed in the flood, and then they all got washed to one place and then turned into something like that. Yeah, yeah not true. Uh, the, only, the only article that, I, that I've read and I've seen written actually by young earth creationists on oil was from a British person, and he, in his paper, he ended up describing the conventional methods because he'd worked for he was working for an oil company, probably BP. I'm not, but I'm not sure it was BP, but probably. And he described all those methods, and he came to the end of the paper. He says, "But I believe that God just created this all this oil directly just in Creation Week." Just boom. Yeah. And that's why he left it. Thank and, that, you. and that gives absolutely no answer 
to the geological structures in which oil is located. So mm -hmm. with, yeah. with their model, when were the structures produced? Just nothing fits together. <laughs> Hey Ken, can you send me uh, this diagram also on your? This uh, is yes, that. I probably probably what I'll do now. These these couple of slides are in fact at the end. You were asking ninety nine slides. Well, these are in that in that. Uh, yeah, these are the ones after the talk. We we probably need you to come and and give us another talk <laughs> regarding oh, geologists about. for geology oh. for non geologists. <laughs> Well, ask any of those questions because that that's just fine. I I'm happy to do it. Yeah, I'll send you the whole thing, and then you said I'm you you want me also say for July. You gave me a date in July. Yes, July seventeenth. You you talked about the Grand Canyon. If if you want, what? if you have questions, you want to ask about some of these that would like answered. Just please send me an email. Okay, great. Well, All right, so, go ahead. Uh, the thing that I really appreciate is how um, you are bringing m multiple uh, evidences from various um, processes and it, it makes a complete story. Uh, and that's the beauty of it. Yeah, it yeah. Goes together very nicely. And, and as opposed to, um, <laughs> I mean, I, one of the things uh, that they talk about the speed of light being different going in depending on which directions it's going and they make up all this stuff which again seems to be uh against occam's razor you know it's, <laughs> it's, it's very convoluted in terms of it's a very it's a very difficult theological knot yes tangled up in it. it's very sad what really breaks my heart is when we get a letter or an email message from a with from a university student um, can you help me? I was raised in a young earth church and I'm now learning that what I was taught is not true. I want to know that my faith is not a lie. And that just hurts. But that a young person raised in a young earth church, he's going to university his faith is going to be at risk. And um, that is why I'm, I'm making efforts increasingly to reach uh, young earth community through the, home through the homeschool conventions. It is said that young earth people, young earth church try to tie uh, our Christian faith uh, based on the young earth thinking. Uh, you know, which is not a biblical interpretation, but anyway, yeah, that's yeah. dangerous for young people. Yeah, it's very, uh, it's it's just just risky, and yeah. it's a modern movement. It happened. The book that brought this into the church is referred to as the Genesis Flood, <laughs> and the author of the Genesis Flood went back to that 1956 paper by Claire Patterson and George Tilton. And he directly misquoted it, and it's just painful. Mm -hmm. hmm. yeah. yeah, we homeschooled, and I remember watching some of the Ken Ham, you know, videos and stuff. And then, you know, some interesting stuff, but it's like, no, it doesn't doesn't hold together. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't fit together, and yeah. it's not related. The, the one that fla flabbergasted me the most, I think, and I said it to one of my Christian brothers that my church uh, uh, I worship at an evangelical Presbyterian church EPC now and I made a comment to one of my brother Christian brothers there that AIG makes the claim that the earth is old and if there are animals that died they're in the fossil record prior to sin but then Christ's death on the cross is meaningless it's like his jaw just dropped open like, where do they get that? <laughs> and that's the, the right question. They, they, they just grab it out of the air. Yeah, we were at an airport, my wife and I. Okay, we were in the lounge and there was like an Orthodox Jew all dressed up. 
Yeah. And she goes up to him and she's like, what does yam mean? <laughs> okay. <laughs> does that mean 24 hours? And he's like, no, it could be any period of time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because that's always the phrase they latch on to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. She got up, she just, she's just asking an honest question to, to right. a, a city Jew. Yeah. <laughs> Did the conversation go fairly politely then, or was he a Oh, guy? yeah. A little polite. Yeah, good. Well, that's great. It's, it's actually Dave's sister. So <laughs> it's my sister. <laughs> uh, the brave one. Anyway, so. Thank you so much. We really appreciate uh, your presentation. We, I personally learned a lot. Wow. Uh, and uh, we, we, were, well, we were very happy you're coming back again in July. So everybody save your questions uh, for that time. And, and we'll hear additional uh, presentation about Noah's blood or maybe Grand Canyon thing mm -hmm. from Ken again. So uh, let's close out with a prayer. Uh, Chuck, let, me, you... let me ask a question. Yes. I didn't really develop one of the radiometric dating methods too well. Should I, should I lessen maybe the Grand Canyon story and, and include that, would you think? Or what, what, yes. About this yes. what do you think? I think that would be a good idea. I'll I think so to know more about radiometric yeah. dating. Yes. Treat it treat that i'll start with that sort of as a sequel to this developing okay. that better and then because generically you, you don't you don't really need that much content if you will about the grand canyon i don't think by comparison to understanding how this radiometric dating methods work and and then i'll include some of the content related to some ideas of how flooding happened in that part of the world that are very likely connected with Noah's flood in some way. Okay, okay thanks. Thank you. Hey, Chuck, would you close up with a prayer, please? Sure, sure. So dear Lord, thank you for uh, this evening together to be able to share our faith and our wonders and all those things that you've created for us. Uh, I'm just am amazed at the, the intricacies of the world and all that you've done just to give us mm. a, a humble place to, to worship you. Uh, bless Ken as he's out sharing uh, his understanding and his compassion, bring those people to him that will benefit from the information that he has to share. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, helping us deal with this pandemic. And we're very appreciative of uh, our time that we do get to spend together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, thank you, guys. I'll see you. See you. Thank, thank you, Ken. Thank you, David. Thanks, Ken. My thanks, David. special thanks to all of you for joining me. I really... You you can tell I'm called to do this, you know. And yeah. Surprise! I'm 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 even more shocked as I think about it year after year. But it's God fine. bless you. <laughs> God is seeing you. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, my mission for this season of my life, and it's being fun. I'll tell you. Yeah. Okay. God bless. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.